Hi everyone, this is a new session where, uh, you know, we continue to kind of explore and research, you know, uh, abstracting providers. Uh, in the last session, you know, was that like a couple of weeks ago or something like that? You know, we basically <laughs> talked about, yeah, it's, I, I kind of, I kind of bailed on you last time, you know, but, <clears throat> but, uh, but this time I won't. <laughs> so uh, this has been a hot topic, you know, in, in the standard community, we've been talking about you know, okay, we want to push non-standardized systems integration a little bit further from from the system. And I was just explaining this to a buddy of mine yesterday. I want to share this, you know, with people, and then uh, Ken will will dig a little bit deeper into uh, what we're really trying to implement. So, whatever system you're building, whatever system you're building out there, that system can be one of two things. It can be either a utility system. A utility system so you're basically going and building something like a library right or uh, a you know you know something that is useful and helpful for other systems to use right in order for it to fulfill a certain purpose right as long as you're further away from uh, actually impacting an actual end user then it's just systems supporting other systems right and then there is there's domain systems, domain systems. So a domain system is like building a schooling system, for instance. You're basically building a schooling website or an, a web application. And you want to talk to the database. You want to have a UI. You want to be able to allow people to interact, you know, with your system like that. There are, of course, of course, there's like a third one that sits in the middle, which is hybrid systems that are supporting other systems, but are also being consumed by real real life users and stuff like that so it's not really domain it also has some utility but it's also being consumed by users so here's the deal you know we've been saying just to bring people up to speed you know we've been saying we have brokers and then we have a service and then we have a a um a, a controller which is an exposure point Right, and these three are talking to each other, and that's your web API. The problem that we're having is that these brokers would talk to underneath to non-standardized systems, right? Something like EF Core, for instance, right? So it's talking to Entity Framework Core, and Entity Framework Core is throwing, you know, for instance, throwing exceptions that are specific to the technology that it's integrated with. So if you're talking to a SQL database, you're gonna end up receiving a SQL exception coming from this guy. So that's a SQL exception. We're just explaining this, you know, in the chat. So this SQL exception will go all the way up here, right? And in some cases, the people that say put in a middleware in here, it will go all the way up here, right? The people that say put middleware and catch all the exceptions and don't handle them internally. Okay. Well, that's a little problem, right? Because you know, first of all, one of the biggest problems that we have today is that we don't even know what exceptions some of these libraries even throw, right? Like, I can't tell you how many times we go and say, okay, we want to integrate with um, a, 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 an Azure queue or an SDK for Twilio or SynGrid or whatever the case may be. And we'll be like, what are the exceptions that this, you know, function is throwing? God forbid someone puts in some good documentation, you know, that says, "Hey, here's all the exceptions." Like, <laughs> like I'll, 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 I'll tell you, I'm, I'm telling you, like, if you want to build something, you know, at least tell people, right? Like, what, what exceptions you're throwing, right? And this is, I've mentioned this, but like a couple of times, I was basically telling people, like, why? Let, let, let's just pick up one of these functions. I tell people why. This is what I'm jealous of for when it comes to Java. Java will say, mm -hmm. you can't write this function unless you say throws. And it has all the, all the exception handling stuff. But there's a way around it. If you're building something for exposure, you can literally just say exceptions. And it will literally go and say, hey, what is, like, it will find, like, oh, SQL validation or dependency, etc. Like, it finds the type for you. Right. So see, and, and you can do this again and again. Let's go up in here and say SQL dependency exception and SQL service exception. Right. Of course, these comments, you want to put them at the exposure layer. I see people putting comments mindlessly everywhere in the code. Like I see, Kenny, have you ever, you, you, you're a senior engineer, you've been around. So have you ever seen 
comment that does this in your um hold on so it will do something like this its name that's a very useful comment right there that's yeah that's that's <laughs> well, the stuff. Well, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. see what's great about the summaries too so when somebody pulls on your sdk like as you just mentioned when you hover like if you hover over your function you just created right it gives yep. you all that in the pop-up of just yep. saying um like when you exactly. hover over that method right exactly um, hover over retreat yeah if you do retrieve um whatever the function is up top it'll tell you all the different things about it and so when yep. you put an exception like or the comment that like you have above yep. you don't get any of that, that fruit but wait, why is it not giving it to me though? Hold on, let's zoom yeah, in. That's weird. It's supposed to. Uh, here is some summary about this function because it used to, at least as far as I can remember. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, throws validation exception. I'll just throw a couple of comments just to see. Could be that. Yeah, there it is. So, so here's some yeah. summary. Do you see that? Here's some summary about this function. But also, I remember, because that's really important. Um, um, I'm just trying to find uh, the, there is a specific way where you can basically describe your function in a way that basically says, yeah, it should be just exception. You should just write exception. And it should tell you Let's see, what are we missing here? Uh, if you hover over line 30, try hovering over line 30 to see. Um, like if you hover over the method name. Oh, hover like here? Yeah, there it is. Do you yeah. see those? So this is here that you can't even navigate to. But I want to see this when I use the function, though. So retrieve O SQL. Oh, yeah. I was thinking maybe because you didn't have the expression in there that it didn't pick up just yet. It, it's It's possible. Like I see it when I hover here, that's for sure. Like if you yeah. look, if you, if I go over here, yeah, it's telling me. I don't know if that's. Oh, is it because? Let's see. Is it because we're in the same function? Let's see. Just out of curiosity, uh, what's using OSQL service at this point in time? Right, that, uh, that reference. And also, that yeah, reference. and also, I think these they don't even go on top of your core implementations. They should go on top oh, of your interface. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. that's that's what the interface is mandating. It's saying, hey, here's what I want you to have in order for this to work. Uh, and maybe that's why it's not working. Let's see. So if I go into. Let me just go into back into this one. And just say public class, whatever. And then if I go and say private, re private, read only. I SQL query uh, service, SQL service, like this. And this is my SQL, O SQL service, right? So now if I do into this constructor and I say this dot O SQL service dot retrieve. So it's, it's showing the summary, but it's not showing the rest of it. There is a, there is a trick to it. I don't remember. <laughs> it was but ideally you want to basically it's like it's like xml kind of thing mm -hmm. and so it's basically going and saying okay these these exceptions are the ones i want to um exception exception and this is those, check those crefs out real quick something's weird about the crefs they like isn't supposed to highlight into a different uh color like on line 16 yeah um, yeah, yeah so maybe there's some issue with that like is it for some reason not picking that up maybe I, it's possible so let's see if i do this and i say throws validation exception what does that mean here no there is there's a trick to it yeah. I, you know i want to well, yeah huh, no, i was thinking like i wonder if the reference for some reason wasn't picking up that o sql uh exception like i wonder if we need to add a using statement for it. Like, I'll, usually it highlights to the uh, different color. I think when the when you import a class in there, and it's pulling the type. Should but, yeah, it should. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna copy one just outside, like one that's literally from the internet. Like I just stole it from the <laughs> internet, just to see yeah. if it's something I'm missing in my structure. No, it's it, there's something else going on. Hmm. 
Oh, well, that's annoying. Uh, because ideally, if you look at look at this guy, he has he has this. See, it's the exact same structure in here, and then that's what I expect to see. Do you see those? Yeah. Yep. That's basically what I expect to see. So, I bet there is a way for. There's probably some configuration that needs to be done. Anyway, I'll dig into it. That's not a problem. But what I'm basically trying to say is that, like, you know, the these methods, back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, if you want... So standardized systems now will require, if you're developing a library, you need to also provide what kind of exceptions this library is going to be throwing, right? At least at your exposure layer. Okay, great. If that's the case, then then we need to push this further. And what these SPAL or standard standardized provider libraries, what it's going to do, it's going to basically go and say, you could have as many providers as you want. We're going to have this one box that you're going to have to adhere to, you know, which is basically abstractions kind of library. But it also offers that, you know, um, uh, phantom phantom representation of the resource. So the broker will always deal with the one unique exception, which is something like storage connection exception. Whatever that storage connection exception may be, and whatever that storage may be, right? And then you let your system kind of interact with these systems, you know, with that, like, like at this point, for the people that are developing domain systems, they never have to worry about working with non-standardized systems because even the libraries that they're using to interact with the outside world is also standardized so it's pushing that that realm a little bit further uh, to that point um so anyway so people have been trying different things like i ran this idea by christo and you know people that you know kind of people such as yourself people that are i kind of appreciate their uh, uh input and and how they invest in the growth of the standard and its evolution. What I always tell people, I'd be like, okay, don't let a, a, a day go by without having to uh, at least use the standard, advocate the standard or evolve the standard. And that's basically what we're doing. You know, we're trying to kind of, because the thing is about the stick industry, if you let yourself go and just not invest in your growth and be a part of the community, years are gonna go by really fast and you don't even know you know, you'd be like, I'm not growing. Like, I have a great job, but I'm not growing. I'm not learning anything, right? And, you know, a job is not always going to guarantee that, you, that you're that you going to be growing and stuff like that because the priorities are different and stuff like that. But anyway. They can always follow you on social media and actually look up the posts. Like the one you just did for the built-in API Explorer for preview. I was like. <sighs> <laughs> oh, the. <laughs> I can, I can just pull up a science news feed and just roll. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what this guy was just telling me right now. He said, if I see your name in the timeline, I know this is going to be good. You know, I don't know. Oh, Every day. <laughs> <laughs> this, guy, <laughs> this guy from the Div Div, uh, his name is Sayed Hashimi. He basically said, hey, here's this little here's this little something for you. I was like, really? you just like, you like nonchalant. You don't care. I'm going to take it out there and tell the world about it. I said, go for it. You know, I want you to. <laughs> You know, and uh, I love, I love how like the community is reacting to this. You know, it's just amazing how, dude, this is this is great. I mean, it it did does exist in VS Code, but bringing it to Visual Studio is completely amazing. But anyway, you know, like I said, these little these little things that I share, I intentionally share them because I want to tell people learn something new. Okay, I can't get to you. I'm gonna send you a Giphy, and if you can't just watch. A two-second Giphy. Uh, at this point in time, I don't know how to get to you and teach you something new today. <laughs> you know, it's lost. <laughs> it's, it's completely lost at that point. <laughs> oh man. The funny part is, you know, this is this is what I really like and I enjoy, you know, about social media. There is, you know, usually it's a preview feature that it's not even out there. Like you can't even get that preview feature. And there's always this one person. Hey, Paul. There's always this one person that pops up and says, I've been using this for years. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the club. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yep. And I'm like, 
<laughs> I'm like my brother in tech, you know, I just deployed. This just got deployed, like literally right now. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Unless, unless you're from a different timeline, I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, anyway, it's it, some people just have to say something, right? So it's okay, you know. When when people, the beautiful thing about social media is that it doesn't matter what you're saying; you're sharing your entire network with me, because everyone in your network will see that you commented, and when they see that you commented, see the post that you commented on. So now they get to benefit from that. So no such a thing as bad publicity. Go ahead and insult all you want. You know, it's definitely going to reach out, you know, however many, you know, maybe the couple of people you have in your know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> <You> know. <laughs> anyway. All press is good press. <laughs> <laughs> All press is good press, right. So anyway, let's let's just dig into this. So uh, Christo wrote something that's quite interesting. He basically went and said, I'm going to have this um, – provider pattern right so he's gonna go and say here's storage abstract provider that's a spell that's what we call a spell it has very generic libraries like these right it doesn't really know anything other than it, it has an injection for a provider so there's a provider that gets injected into this uh interface uh, sorry into the uh, the the constructor of this uh concrete class and this provider can be anything. So he went on to say, here's entity framework storage provider that implements iStorage provider. Right? And you can attach whatever else you want in there. And then he went on to say, okay, here's another one as well. So he has, yeah, I think he only did one. He only did just the one. So there's a, the abstract provider, and then there's the entity framework storage provider. Right? I, th I think this might be okay okay but i am hoping that i could have something as simple as just saying use sql server or use you know this provider or that provider just extensions basically right it might just require another layer on top of it so ken i know you sent me something earlier about uh, an attempt that you made as well with uh, uh abstracting providers do you want to kind of walk through this and we just want to see what sure. attempts people have out there and see what we can do with it. Go ahead. All right, let me just share a screen. Let's see. First time sharing on this side, so I'm like, where? I have a no. wide monitor, so I'm trying to figure out what's the best way. To... So, so share window, that's for sure. Don't share the whole monitor. And yeah, uh, and uh, and one other thing is, it's the it's the box in the middle that, so, that the present. Um... So it's not quite spoiled. Oh, there you go. There you go. I, I can show you what I did in our data layer. Yes. Um, because I. Next. Yes. Yeah, because I abstracted out the database specific stuff mm -hmm. for, from the EF stuff mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. to do exactly what you're talking about, essentially by configuration. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's it's halfway towards Spal, but it's not quite there. It's 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 it's, it's a good step. It's the inspiration of Spal, right? It's yeah. the inspiration of Spal. Like I'll tell you where Spal came from. Or ideally, this series. When I started talking to Ken about this originally, we were trying to abstract away service bus, right? And we got into a prototype that actually works. It was perfect, right? Now, well, not perfect, but it works, right? So, and then we went a little bit further and we said, okay, in order for us to actually finish this job, in order for us to actually implement LakeQ that talks to Levent and talks to any other provider, we need to come <clears> up with a path. This is, you know, mid-December, it hit me. I was like, okay, we need, we need something a little bit better than just kind of uh, having too much information in the broker itself. Anyway, Ken, do you want to zoom in a little bit? Because some people watch this on their phones. Uh, just do control. Uh, do if you do control shift period, it will. Okay, you got it. Okay, fine. Yep, that works. Yeah, that's the one fifty. Uh, let me know if I need to zoom out a little bit. I'll just control. I have the mouse. No, no, this control. is perfect. Uh, you know, you can you can actually minimize the left side for the. Oh yeah. Because we don't care and. Uh, and we don't care about tests. We do, but. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm totally, joking. <laughs> totally joking. No. Um, okay. Here we go. So I'll actually. And I'll make this a little bit bigger. I don't think we have any long names here. So, yeah, it's all right. Can you see this one okay as well? Yeah, yeah, this is perfect. I can see it. Nice. Go ahead. Awesome, awesome. 
All right. Yeah. The, I think uh, I want to start probably. So I guess I start all the way at the beginning of the store. So we mentioned, you know, Hassan, uh, we, I don't know if this is the branch. I don't think this is a branch you had originally where you were able to bring in wire mod and spin the server up and do all this sort of thing. So um, I didn't really have all the resources here just yet. So I kind of didn't want to mess with the original framework too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically I set up a way to where um, I'm just leveraging what we have for a proof of concept, right? Just kind of mm -hmm. visualize what we're doing here. So um, this is a little bit on the, the rough side. So Oh, well, uh, oh, <laughs> but yeah, so starting here inside of the vent, that would be more of your core framework, right? Um, and right now, I think we had on the, the branch you were working on had a way to, uh, mm. I think we did a service bus, I believe, right? Yeah. So yeah. Th this one here right now, this is just at the at the earlier stages of that where we were just passing events and doing the processing. Yep, yep. Um, yep. These are your core uh, services where um, a library that wants to extend on top of that would pull this in, right? And they don't actually have to see all your internals, right? Because a lot of your stuff you'll have internal, you yep. might not want people to yep. modify, or you might open up some for extension, right? But yep. some of the core yep. things you don't really want to extend because you want to make sure you have consistency across the frameworks. Um, so this is a quick example of that. Um, just adding uh, the services, and we have a list of event registrations because the wire mock solution that you had, you pretty much wire up and say, hey, when I receive this object, send this object. When I receive this and that. So it's basically a list of service registrations. And so this is, you, you could do a bunch of different implementations of these depending on what you want to expose. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I won't dig into too much of this, this side of things, but this is just the core framework. Mm -hmm. um, so someone from a, uh, user's perspective of, of extending the, the framework, um, they would actually pull in your uh, services uh -huh. this way, right? So I think we mentioned, I, for this example, I did um, uh, event grid, right? Uh -huh. for, uh -huh. for yeah, yeah, that works. Yeah, that and works. so if you want to standardize how that is in the background, right now we have the, the options you have, endpoint URL and some key credentials to allow you to connect. So those are some options that someone would want to register. Let me move this down though, because I'm done with that one. Um, that's some <laughs> options that you would register. So that would allow them, if you, if you put event grid options in your app settings, it would go and pull these things from it, right? So however you want to configure it, you could, it would just, you could have that ready. Um, or you can extend this to actually allow someone to inject that originally, right? You can have a configure method that you can extend this method on. So the good thing about these extension methods, you can make this as flexible as you want to, if you want them to, be able to configure the options there or just have it in their app settings and just putting a your summary notes, right? Putting some summary up there and letting them know like what they need to configure and that kind of thing. Nice. So that's and some good documentation as well. Um, and actually here is the example of adding the um, options here, right? Okay. So someone can say use Azure Event Grid and then have their uh, their builder and I'll actually walk into the builder here. Oh, and second. you made it an action yeah. just like the, nice, nice. So I can just say options, fat arrow, and I can do whatever I want with them. Nice. Exactly. So here, here's a test that probably doesn't work, but <laughs> it's basically showing how you can do that here, right? So you could say, okay, you could use Azure Vinker like this. Um, you can extend it and add a, um, you know, here's your options. Um, An arrow. Um, yep. Options dot. Oh, right. nice. And this is poorly formatted, but right, options dot. Uh, key so some people like to do some double configuration settings because they're pulling it from Azure Key Vault and weird stuff, right? Oh, not weird stuff, but good stuff. <laughs> but, um, you know, you can do that. And this, let me actually just format this for my eyes. Do you have to return anything? Um, in this, oh, yeah, no, you don't actually. Oh, you're right, yeah. you're right. So, there, so I would put that on a different line, but either way, you could do something like that. And it's just kind of a rough draft of like things you can do to extend that. Um, so going back to, perfect. okay, keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here is your builder. So the builder allows us to be a little bit more flexible with what we allow them to do, right? Mm -hmm. Cause we can actually open this up and not actually have to change our methods at all. Um, so the builder, let me go into this implementation. Uh, this is what they're using to actually add events. So, you know, that list of events yep. that you have to call for wire mock to say, set this up, set that up. Yep. Um, event, great event is the Azure event. Grid mm -hmm. model. This mm -hmm. is actually from their messaging uh, model. Yep. So uh, we could 
abstract that away a little bit if you wanted to make it more robust between different messaging platforms. Um, but this is their base model that they have. And so adding this event registration to the list of it. And so at the end, the builder will build it by just returning the list. I mean, there, you could do some more things behind the scenes if you need to configure some stuff or add some default options or overrides or whatever else. Um, so they would add that build is what you're going to be calling on the inside. So here's an example of how that looks. You mm -hmm. pat, you give them the builder, they add, build on it with their configuration. And then you're adding your, your options, right? Cause they, you know, at this point they didn't pass it in, in this method. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then you would add your event services that you have, but you're doing a build and giving a list of the options that they now have configured through this builder action. Um, so, and so that's how, they could, you know, intercept into the, the framework without having to wire up all your services. Here's here's the event services that yep. you're yep. wiring up all that yep. stuff. So that was just kind of a rough draft. And so the test actually shows how that would look from a user perspective. Um, by this point, you know, you're in your um, program with your builder.services and you say, okay, I want to add Azure event grid. And then so yeah, I have okay, build, my handle. subject and here's my handler. And the event handler is up here, it's just a local function right here. I'm just saying, hey, uh, trigger trigger this event. And here's here's a setup for that. Like I'm just basically I want to yep. interact and just say like test that I called this mock event basically. Yep. So I'm yep. um, pretty much wiring that up. So this is, but however, this will be something that they set up to say, hey, this call when I get this message, send this payload or vice yep. versa. However, yep. that goes, yep. that transformational stuff. Nice. Nice. I'm just trying to think, Paul, do you have any thoughts on this? So, so have, have you, to, to my mind, like the, the configuration here is basically saying, hey, I'm configuring a lot of event grid stuff, but my understanding of the the SPAL stuff was essentially um, you would configure um, the abstraction and you'd say, hey, within the abstraction, I want to use event grid, right? So, that's where your event grid specifics come in, essentially. So I guess my, my difficulty with this is the abstraction is basically saying, hey, it doesn't matter what the underlying implementation is, what the provider is, right? Um, but at the application level, it kind of does matter because we've still got to configure all of that stuff. But then the code that consumes that is effectively generic, right, in a sense, because you could swap this stuff out with, say, as your service bus. And in theory, if it followed the same abstract provider interface, then all that would change would be the configuration at the app level. Is that right? That, that, that's what I'm hoping for. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Which, is, which is not too far from this. Like, here's the thing. Just using SPAL doesn't mean that you don't know what technology you're interfacing with. The only difference is that you don't have to change all the ways you're handling your exceptions because instead of saying handle SQL exception, you're handling failed storage exception, which is a question that I was going to ask Ken in a second. You know what, like we can abstract away models and routines, but how do you catch people from, because, because Ken, you know, people are going to have to implement their own extensions of a certain SPA library, right? So they're going to go and say, okay, this is the event library i want to implement for whatever aws is offering whatever azure is offering whatever google is offering and they're going to be throwing some exceptions right mm -hmm. two, two requirements here and this is for the life of me you know been like three months now i don't know what the answer is how do we catch these people from throwing exceptions that are not not the contract exceptions right so i don't want them to throw sql exception i want them to throw a failed storage exception, but how do you force that? Like, how do you, when they're trying to use your abstraction, how do you catch that and say, hey, this implementation is invalid in design time? In design yeah, so this, time. Yeah, so this, this implementation, I got to really kind of dig into that a little bit because this implementation was more so for the um, that middle piece where it would kind of allow you to toggle your, your backend services. So this was going to say, hey, I can call a false, or I guess let's just say false. I can call a mock uh, mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. or I can call the real service. And so this, this was really kind of that way to allow you to, if, in the backend of these, in the, the event, right, you can pass maybe a setting in the builder saying, 
um, mock mode or developer mode or something, right? And then yep. you can like, you know, again, call the wire mock services versus your actual service. Um, so it's, so this is kind of taking it a little bit further now um, to basically say um, at that, you know, replacing that sort of uh, broker level of, you know, exceptions that we're throwing. And so really, I wasn't really sure on who would be designing all the extensions. I mean, you could have a kind of code of, um, not code of ethics, but a code of like standardizing what you're looking for in your application. Because if we put this in a certain repo where you have contributors, like, you know, how Microsoft extensions kind of start off, right? Where that Microsoft extensions that yep. login and stuff, and you know, they always have community people inputting stuff as well. So they can, you can still control the repository for some of the extensions yep. and just make sure that as we're developing it, the exceptions are throwing at a standard way and whatever yep. else, but people consuming that, um, and they're, they're building on top of that extraction, yes. Yes. abstraction, that's not at their application level. Right. So that's kind of on them if they're saying at their core level, uh, hey, I'm using this framework and they have a standard set of exceptions they're going to throw. When I actually use their event grid um, implementation at that point, you know, it's kind of on them to make sure that they're handling either they can either use your exceptions or they can, you know, kind of extend on theirs. But I, I was on the assumption kind of that these extension methods would be kind of governed in a way. Right. Like it wouldn't be a free for all of. <laughs> you know, anyone's kind of creating, you know, these, because I feel like it's kind of these smaller pieces are building to a bigger, like, kind of like that pyramid, right? Kind of yep, like yep, at the top yep. you have Levin, and then yep. underneath yep. you have the small components that are leading up to it. Um, and I thought that pyramid slice would be more of the um, the governed side of it, right? Where those components would be governed. But so, yeah, um, so this yeah. is where <laughs> this is where I was going, right? So you'd have, instead of having service collection dot use as your event grid, you would have like service collection dot um i don't know use eventing abstraction or something and then that would give you the options builder and in there you would say use okay that. yeah 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 use sure. event grid so what that would mean is that the outer layer is our abstraction api and the inner layer is the stuff that's specific to event grid that we've encapsulated or in the event of because we've referenced a different provider um, let's say you pulled in as your service bus instead, um, you'd have different available options, if you like, as extent extension methods to that base, you know, I eventing options thing that's passed into that Lambda. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. So I'm okay. probably talking really abstract here. And I'm really, yeah, no, I, I, I'm I get what you're to, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm trying to sort of do it at, at, whilst a sort of making it understandable to people that are perhaps really struggling to keep up with this because i realize yep. a lot of people are going to watch this and i think a lot of the feedback that you tend to get Sam, is like what, what are you talking you about, talking about? Yeah. yeah i and get so, that a lot people be like hey i just started c sharp what is this what are you talking about and i don't know how to tag advanced topic mm -hmm. versus introductory topic i, I agree with you by the way, just yeah. while while Paul is explaining this, I'll take the, the screen from you first. Actually, don't don't unshare yeah. your screen because I'm just managing. Uh, 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 you know, uh, Ken, what what Paul is going for? Look at this. Do you see this Microsoft Entity Framework Abstractions Library? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Today, I am using the one for SQL, which is provided by the the original provider themselves. This is why I have this you know use SQL available in here. But watch what mm -hmm. these guys did. The the Postgres guy, the Postgres guy, where they basically went and said NED framework. There it is, Postgres. If I click on this implementation, it's a completely different company, right? But look mm -hmm. what they have in their library: Microsoft Entity Framework Core Abstractions and Relations. If I install that guy, which is already installed in here, watch watch what happens here. Now I can take this options builder, which is the same pattern you're doing. I can say use Postgres. Hold on, let me install it real quick. There, because I did a revert. Hold on. So this here, yeah, it doesn't even exist anymore. That's right. So if I close this, this is. This I, is I get what you're saying though. It's like a, it's yes, like an entryway. Yes. It's like yes. allowing. It's it's a little more extract abstract but, but, enough but what, that they can build on top of it yes but what they didn't know how to do is that it can throw literally any exception and you can't control it mm, yeah yeah that's and i was talking to a, a buddy of mine i don't know if he wants his name to be mentioned but he's a very smart guy and he basically said 
he said to me, now that's a problem because exceptions can come from anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what, what do I do now? He's like, I don't know. I need to think about this. And this is why I'm bringing this up. Look, this is not an easy problem to solve, but it's a very important one to do, right? So look, use use Postgres. Post, come on, help me out. Is I was literally showing it to the guy yesterday. <laughs> use. Yeah, this is what I was saying. Ken. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, if, if we can wrap, Postgres. yeah, go ahead, if, go ahead. If, if we can wrap that up in a sort of um, service collection dot use database provider or something abstraction, and then that mm. has an options builder in it that we do like this on. So then, yeah. whoever's implementing the specific, you know, um, so if it's like a database provider, it will be like, oh yeah, use EF. And, these are my configuration options, you know, or use Dapper and these are my configuration options. But it's it's an extension to our options builder. So mm -hmm. our options builder is providing the abstraction effectively, mm -hmm. which is the interface that the user's code is coded against. Yeah. The so the consumer's coding against the abstraction. And um, the way to look at it is kind of like, EF is sort of an abstraction. And then the Microsoft SQL and the MySQL and the Postgres SQL are all provider implementations of the yeah. interface that we get from EF. So my thinking was that what we're trying to achieve here is kind of like another layer of, layer of abstraction upon that. So if we had like an abstract CRUD provider, for example, which is one of the conversations we were having in the week, you know, we would say add CRUD provider, and then we would say use EF and configure it with this DB context mm -hmm. for a yep. given key. So my thinking was that, yeah, at the configuration level, you want to sort of force constraint to using our um, service collection extensions as part of the, if you like, the abstraction provider itself. Um, by by saying okay it's the abstraction you're configuring and within the abstraction you're saying use this provider does that make sense <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so it's kind of like you would say so uh, instead of saying azure event grid we say like use um limit event messaging or something right mm -hmm. and then you provide an options builder that says hey i actually want to use azure event grid and these are the configurations for that but we we give them the options to build on top of ours for the must have things, right? So if we say that you can add um, Azure Event Grid, we had, we know we at least at a bare minimum we need the uh, the key creds and the URL, right? So the endpoint URL. So at that point, whatever they do on top of that, like they can you know customize and do some different things. But we when we actually run the code on our side, when we actually run that function of um, or we actually bind to that that instance of that event event grid, we actually have the bare minimum we need, but they're wrapping it with all the extra stuff that they want to do on their end by building it by, by, um, yeah. Yeah. So that makes sense. In, in addition to Hassan's issue about exception handling, which is a whole different ball game of problems, yeah. I guess. <laughs> um, you think? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> my, my sort of big headaches were around things like Where's the value from a consumer point of view in terms of if I'm thinking about this from a very simplistic, you know, what a senior developer is going to think here, right? So I've got a cul-de-sac that I've built. And on the bottom of my cul-de-sac, I've got this broker. And what I want my broker to do is go to a database and do stuff, right? Interact with a table because it's, you know, I'm at the broker level. I followed the standard. So I've got T, right? What is the advantage of having this abstraction layer in my configuration in the middle of all of this versus not having this? Because at the way it's currently coded at the moment, what if you look at the way that the standard is documented, I have some iStorage broker and I extend that um, or I implement that essentially um, and what I'm doing right there is I'm implementing the EF functionality. Whereas what we're saying here is there's an additional layer that goes between our code and the EF piece. So what is that layer adding? Now, I think I know the answer to that, of course, but 
it's one of these things that is going to be a really hard sell for a large community of people because they're going to be looking at this and going, well, I can just skip that layer and just configure these things directly and it will still work perfectly fine. And I'm shortening my pipe length, if you like, um, in terms of call chains. Uh -huh. And I don't have all of this extra dependency stack in my own dependency stack, if you like. And so I've been kind of sitting here thinking, this is going to be probably the hardest thing for people to understand, right? Because from a like testing and maintainability point of view, for example, the ability to just rip a dependency out, plug in a new one, is awesome but day to day how often do people actually do that and you know when you sit down like in mine or Hassan's possibly yourself as well Ken you know in our position where you're like leading a team and you're surrounded by a bunch of seniors and they're all saying what's the point just uh -huh. talk to your database it's the equivalent of like I've actually had a senior cloud engineer say to me one day like why can't I just instance this EF context inside my Azure function method directly? Why do I need all of these services in between? And it's like, <laughs> this is the level that people are thinking at, right? And the controller, like, just instantiate in the controller. That's how yeah, literally it. in control oh. because they go, well, I saw this on a tech demo, you know, Microsoft went to build recently and they showed some new feature with EF and they just whacked on EF context it's, in the it's control. A prototype. Like, it's just to show you the gift. <laughs> oh my God. But, <laughs> but this is the level that people think at, right? Yeah. So given that they don't see the reason to put a service between a controller and an EF DB context, when you then say, okay, there's another layer here that you've got to provide an extraction, why? <laughs> it's like, I've okay. now got to explain this, right? And how do I explain this? And look, 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 <laughs> look, look, they're not even supposed to know it exists. Like if you're working with junior engineers or either seniors, even principal and partner level engineers, you know, yeah. they say, hey, we need to talk to the database, right? Yeah, yeah. Today, you are, people today are using SPAL isk kind of thing when they go and say use sql right when they use the entity framework and they say yeah. use sql they are using spell like implementation right nobody asks why the only difference here is that we're saying this is non-standardized like these these this right. library is developed in a way that doesn't th throw known exceptions other than db update exception which is yeah. why we had to go build exceptions Right. So but, really what, what the answer is, is basically just don't tell them because it should be transparent enough anyway that it doesn't matter <laughs> effectively. You, and they, and they, I think that's probably a valid answer. Like, I'm not look, like, look, taking the mic or anything. Look, it's like, you're look, this, right. is, this is where I learned in the tech industry. Not everybody is in it for the science and the, uh, you know, amazing implementation. For it. Some people just want to move a card across the board and say it's done. Right. We want to enable them to do that while underneath it's actually doing something so freaking amazing right yeah. like like i'll tell you something our brains our brains they're amazing systems right like they're, it's they're, fine. they're all, right? all 20 of us should just get on a call like this one day and just rebuild the internet <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not that dude you know you know that dude that built the internet that invented the internet his name is surf he looks like the architect from the Matrix. He looks exactly like the architect from the Matrix. <laughs> You'd expect exactly bold dude, white beard, you know, and he's really – I got to show you. I got to show you this guy. You know, this is Surf. Surf is the dude here. You know? I know people that genuinely think that Steve Jobs invented the internet. And I'm like, <laughs> no, no. That's not how it works. Well, you know, I mean, I mean people are saying Elon Musk invented chat GPT. <laughs> no, this is this is a real reel with hundreds of thousands of likes on it. You know, someone explaining Chat GPT to the masses, and he doesn't know how to bring it closer to them. So there's this figure, smart guy. Whether he's smart or not, it doesn't matter. But this is figure, smart guy. How do I tell these people to use smart things? Just tell them he invented it, even if it's not true. I mean, he was he was a a, a but an all truth. Open API had contributions, big contributions from Microsoft, but it also had contributions from, from Elon Musk. Like he actually was kind of donating to the cause and all that. Yeah, yeah. He didn't invent the thing though, you know. Anyway, Surf, 
Um, I want to interject something real quick on that point, um, just because I know, you know, there's that paradigm of some folks are like, why can't I just do like I saw in the demo? And then there's also those projects you get into that are so over-engineered. There's like 5 billion handlers to get to the point where you need to get to, right? So I, I think it, it's kind of like, you know, the, the design pattern teaching, right? And everyone was big, you know, about, you know, design patterns. But really what they were supposed to do is show you the trade-offs. Right. Like mm -hmm. if you see this symptom in your code, you should design it this way if you want these pros and cons this way, if you want these pros and cons. So now it's like, hey, let me pick the best thing that matches with my situation. Yeah, right. So I, same thing with a person that's like, hey, well, I can't just throw it in my Azure function. It's like, OK. All right. So are you going to need another, another Azure function to in, you know, interact with that database? Like the database um, yeah. Are you going to need to abstract that away so they both can share the same? Like, are you, are you now copying the same business logic across all your code to talk to the same database? So maybe we should abstract that away. And here's the pros and cons of that. So, you know, I think I think for, for that scenario and they obviously haven't read the standard because, I mean, Hassan talks about things like this on why we're, you know, he, he's okay. building, we're, we're setting the standard for a certain thing. So it's just knowing the pros and cons, right? <laughs> yep. And knowing why. If they care, that's cool. If they don't, you know, yeah. <laughs> but your like, job like, is done. Like, like, I'll tell you the truth, you know, like, like I, you know, when I drive teams, lead teams, work with teams, you know, everywhere, right? You know, some people you will see people that are, by the way, that's the guy that invented the internet. He literally looks like the, the you know, I told you, like the architect from the Matrix. If you want to see <laughs> the architect... On the matrix. Do you think Look, they modeled the guy off of <laughs> off of him? Probably. probably. <laughs> dude, that's crazy. Dude, dude probably. Yeah, you know, they basically went and said, You're gonna be the architect of the matrix, and here's the guy that actually, you know, played the biggest role in inventing the internet. <laughs> so so it's not far off. Anyway, let me just go back to this point and, and we can wrap up because I'm almost an hour, but I'll tell you this. Look, when you're working with software engineers, right? They have all kinds of different purposes, right? Some people are in it just for survival. I just want to pay. I just want something that pays me money, you know, and I don't care how it gets implemented, right? I just want to make the boss happy so I can get paid and promoted. That's all they care about. That's a group of people. I call them employees, right? They, they, they have engineering titles, but they're employees, right? They're just in it to get shit done and just move on. Right. They don't care if this is standardized, non-standardized. They don't care. They just don't. Right. This is these are the exact same folks that will go home like they would never sit down in a call like this. Be like, why would I sit down in a call like this? It doesn't pay me anything. Right. So that's a group of people. And, and unfortunately, that group of people is the vast majority in the tech industry. Like a lot of people just jumped in. If you if you look at the origins of the tech industry and how it started, Back when it wasn't paying so well, there was only a handful of people and people would call them nerds and lock them, put them in the locker room. You know, they show up to school with the same shirt they were wearing yesterday. They treat them like like garbage. Right. And then suddenly these people started driving Lamborghinis. And then people were like, <laughs> why are these people driving Should Lamborghinis? Not, <laughs> right. Like like during like here in the tech industry during these layoffs. Magic. <laughs> You, you can see it very clearly. A lot of people are saying, oh, it's time for me to switch career. I'm not doing engineering anymore because it doesn't pay off anymore. They're laying off people, right? But then there's a group of people outside of that big portion. There's a group of people, you know, that want to do like they, they still have this kind of integrity where they say, I want this to be right. Like I'm in, I'm, 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 I'm entrusted to perform a task. And I want to make sure that this task is done right right? That's a smaller group, like a subset out of this massive group that I just told it. Out of that you, group, we should get all 20 of us together. So wait, wait. <laughs> just wait, just wait. There's more. That little group in the middle, there's a smaller group outside of that that say, I don't want just to do things right. I want to make it righter. I want to make it better. Okay, 10 of us together. Let's that's, get all 10 of us together. that's where we are. That's like all three of us sitting right here we could just go and say, ah, the EF core is already having abstractions and internals. The job's done. Let's just move on. But we're just sitting here saying, no, even the exceptions, I want them to be standardized. Even that I want to make this simple for the, for the mass majority of people. If you're working with one of them and you're saying, oh, let's just get this library. They don't care what library you're using, but you do. 
right? Because you know down the road, if the company goes and says, hey, we can't afford SQL anymore, we want to switch over to NoSQL or we want to switch over to something else, all these exceptions, all these foundation services that you built, you're going to have to rewrite some of them. It's, it's but, funny, if you're yeah. using, but if you're using SPAL, you don't have to do anything. You just have to download one library and say, use blah, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was talking to a group of developers the other day, and I said, you know, if, if you're not at a point where you're effectively day to day, if you, if you can't feel that your job is running out of things to do over time, like, so when you join a company, let's say the backlog is two years long, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff to do, right? And that's why they've employed you, because they need someone new to get rid of what's yep. going on, right? Yep. If you don't feel that impending list of stuff getting shorter, you're probably not really doing much. And therefore, like, I mean, the whole point of developing software, right, is to automate something that isn't currently automated or is currently automated badly or just doesn't work right. Or, you know, just to provide a simpler business process for things and and um the backlash that i got back was you know along the lines of yeah but what about job security and i said well what about it because like do you think farmers were complaining when they were all toiling in the fields before tractors got invented yeah of course they were because it's hard labor right do you think that they bitched and whined when you know thousands of them were put out of work because the tractor did their jobs yeah of course they did but now what are they doing you know, they're not complaining now, are they? That they, you know, they don't get to run around in a field all day and sit there with a hoe and, you know, they're, they're like, yeah, great. We can be doing other things, you know, solve real problems. I, I thought I thought picking strawberries in the middle of July was a head rag. I was wrong. You know, that was a passion. <laughs> what are people talking about? You know, just like, like we're trying to evolve. Like the folks that are saying, stop chat GPT before it takes our jobs. That's exactly the same language that people used to use when they said, we don't need these automobiles. We have horses. Why are we doing that? Anyway. Look, you know, um, the last thing I wanted I wanted to ask you guys because I wrote this. I want to. I always run it by people I I love and and I appreciate and I trust. I want to know that whether this sentence makes sense to you, you know. And do you see it? It's, the sentence says the quality of any software out there is inversely proportional to the amount of manual engagements it requires from the engineers in order to continue to operate. Does this make sense? Is this a right sentence? Yeah. No. So a related sentence that I've heard is the best piece of soft or the, sorry, the best piece of anything is a thing that you don't know is there. As soon as you know, it's there, it's causing a problem. Nice. Nice. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, a software engineer is doing their job when you don't have to talk to them at all because everything is just running smoothly. <laughs> anyway, listen, you know, we're at time. I appreciate the two of you. Uh, Ken, you know, the, you know, the only the only homework assignment that's just something on my side is to kind of take the stuff that you're working on, you know, and kind of try to elevate that. We need a, a working prototype like we already had the working prototype. We already have now something a little bit closer to a prototype, something a little bit more um, uh, um, uh, concrete that we can publish, at least in beta. Right. And this is going to be the very first library that I publish with the two of you. So this is going to be really fun. Like your name is going to be out there on Nougat. You know, we're going to, you're going to have ownership, full ownership over that Nougat. Just be careful the kind of power you have, because when you become an owner, you can literally shut down the library and anybody that's trying to pull that library in their pipelines, you're going to shut their systems down. So be careful what you're, you know, although that Nougat now is putting like, like, right, like uh, protection where they say, if you publish a version, even if you shut down the library, the version is still going to be available. Right, unless there's a, an obvious vulnerability in it and stuff like that. The, the person who built Nougat.org is also David Fowler. If you if you don't know, like he he was like one of the people that actually built this as an idea. So anyway, he's, he's a great innovator. You know, I'll bring him back again on the podcast. But uh, you know, um, let's connect again next week. Let's see if we can have something for ideally outside of this session or this series. I want to publish a library that allows people to communicate with SQL through Entity Framework and communicates with a phantom database for the people that are running on their Macs, they can't just have SQL Server installed on their Macs. So what happens to these, you know, poor rich bastards? What what happens to them? You know, they wow. basically they basically go and spin up a Docker container that Docker. is Windows or SQL that has SQL on it, 
Like, I don't even think about communicating with the database. Like, you already installed all the tools. SQL Server is already there. It's just there, right? And it's Funnily awesome enough, they're doing Azure Edge. <laughs> Funnily <laughs> enough, they, they kicked off all this um, energy crisis recently. And Callum, one of my, my team, he moved back in with his parents. And his parents were complaining about the energy bill. So he went and bought a really cheap, low-end, one of these Mac M1-based um, machines. And as you know, you can't install SQL Server on one of those because it requires an x86 chip. So um, what we came up with was a solution whereby our stack would build and run against a SQL light, um, or potentially if we wanted to, a MySQL database. Um, and the answer was essentially we had to do something like this, but the way that we solved it wasn't quite the full solution. I think mm. we went for a slightly simpler model within EF, but um, what we'll have to do is, is it's probably worth us having like a session just on like how I solved it because that might give you some ideas. I don't want to go over it now because I think, like you said, we've already been here an hour and. Yep. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see kind of like how that could tie in because there's probably some savings that we can do there with just dealing with database providers. Because like you say, EF is already an abstraction of sorts. Yep. But um, by the way, just so you know, like starting around like after the Friday, the 10th of February, you know, I you know, I will be I will be taking some time off, so I will have a lot more time to kind of produce this type of content. You know, like this, this is advanced engineering content. This is not the kitty. You know, someone was mentioning that on, 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 uh, on, uh, on Reddit, you know, someone said, you know, by the way, you can watch this guy's channel, but the stuff he's talking about is not hello world stuff. You know, this is not, okay, we're done with this. Hey, you're creating a model. I mean, I still do that. I mentor people. It's really important. If you're a, a seasoned engineer, you have to mentor people that don't know anything at all or are still beginning because that's how you keep yourself grounded. Otherwise, it's so easy to get there up there in their ivory tower and completely lose touch with reality. We are super at time. I'll talk to you guys later. I appreciate you both. Thank you so much. You take awesome. care. Thank you. All right, Thank have you. Bye.